rates. Now we have a chart here and what you can see in this chart is rainfall rates in Australia over the last 120 years. No genius, it's not. Try reading the text on the image you're displaying. This is specific to New South Wales and is only referring to rainfall in the spring. By this time, the fire season in Australia, which begins in October and is starting earlier and earlier thanks to climate change is over. So about a year ago, I debunked a video by No Bullshit, where he tries to deny the relationship between the increasing intensity of Australia's mega bushfires, and climate change, and instead pretends that the problem is that some imaginary environmentalists are preventing controlled burns. I just ran into a similar video by another YouTuber who goes by the name of Actual Justice Warrior, and so I've decided to debunk this one as well. However, since Potholer54 has made a far more robust and data-rich video debunking similar false claims, I've decided to use his clip so you can see the difference between a McExpert like Actual Justice Warrior, and someone who actually knows what they're talking about. You can find a link to Potholer54's entire video in the description below. What's interesting to note here is how this is the new form of climate change denial. It's difficult to outright deny the reality of human-caused global warming, without pigeonholing yourself as an outright loony, and thereby limiting your audience. So the new, clever way to deny climate change is to deny its role on a case-by-case -case basis. In this case, YouTube mech experts like Actual Justice Warrior simply try and deflect and reframe by misusing and or misunderstanding data, and falsely arguing that environmentalists are preventing controlled burns. So before we get started, don't forget to click or tap the subscribe button and notification icon. Are you ready? Here we go! And I'm going to show you how in reality these very same environmentalists are actually guilty of exacerbating the problem, and Australia has known that these environmentalists have been exacerbating the problem of wildfires for at least 20 years. Now as to be expected, when the wildfire problem first started in Australia, the environmentalists jumped on this and immediately started blaming the Prime Minister of Australia and climate change because we all know global warming's here and that's exactly what's causing these wildfires even though we also say out of the other side of our mouth that you can't blame individual events on global warming. This one definitely due to global warming and definitely due to the inaction of Australia's current prime minister. Okay, so rather than relying on AJW's echo chamber talking points about the fabricated conundrum faced by these mysterious environmentalists who he never actually identifies, let's take a look at what the science has to say. Time to hear again from a real expert. Australia is known for its extremes and without climate change we're a land of extremes because of these variability things that influence us. So we know that at some point they're going to happen but put climate change on top of that and it exacerbates those extremes even further. And it's not just something that we kind of knew about last year. Climate scientists have been talking about this for decades. So we expect to see more extreme heat. When we see flooding, we expect that to be more extreme. And when we get bushfires, we expect them to be more extreme too. And especially over eastern Australia. Over some parts of Australia, there's not really much of a signal. But over the southeast, longer fire seasons and more intense fires are conducive with climate change. So what the experts are saying is that these are natural phenomena. They're what's driven Australian heat waves, droughts and bushfires in the past. But in the last few decades, they've been happening on a rising platform of global temperature, which means that every weather event is more accentuated, from droughts and heat waves to rainfall and floods. Studies have shown the influence of global warming on these natural phenomena. Back in 2009, this study laid the blame for recent droughts on a positive Indian Ocean dipole exacerbated by rising temperatures. And the same year, this paper concluded that the Indian Ocean Dipole Index has been increasing along with regional temperatures and concluded that climate change will increase the occurrence of positive IOD events. Those are the ones that cause drought. So if scientists are pointing the finger at climate change not as a cause but as an amplifier of natural causes, making heat waves, droughts and bushfires worse, what excuses are left to ignore it? Well, it's the old thoughts and prayers excuse. Now is not the time to talk about it. Now this is said because Australia's current prime minister who took office in August of 2018 isn't really warm to climate change. He doesn't really put it as a top priority for his administration, which honestly makes a lot of sense because even if Australia cut their carbon emissions to zero, assuming everything else stayed the same or stayed on the same trajectory, that would only lower global temperatures by 0.05 or 0.5 degrees in the next 50 to 100 years. Okay, 
Now let's watch Potholer 54 unpack and debunk this tired old, horrible, and low information take. As for the argument that Australia only contributes 1.3% of anthropogenic CO2, that's also true. Even if Australia stopped emitting CO2 altogether, it would make very little difference to the global warming trend. But France is only responsible for 0.9% of the world's CO2 emissions, Germany 2.1%, Japan 3.6%. If every country took a view that it doesn't have to do anything because its own CO2 emissions are just a fraction of the total, nothing would ever get done. We'd just expect China to do it alone, and China could then use the argument that its emissions per capita are only 7.7 .7 tonnes a year, less than half those of Australia. So solving an international problem requires international cooperation. Australia has diplomatic clout in the world, and shunning summit meetings on climate change and thwarting international climate agreements by demanding privileged loopholes is not making Australia popular, and it isn't even in our own self-interest. This country stands to benefit more than most from the energy revolution. When an international agreement is made, South Korea and Japan want to build economies based on hydrogen fuel made in Australia, because we have a wealth of clean, renewable energy. It's not going to cost us anything, but what is costing us is the result of government inaction 40 years ago. Now we have a chart here, and what you can see in this chart is rainfall rates in Australia over the last 120 years. No genius, it's not. Try reading the text on the image you're displaying. This is specific to New South Wales and is only referring to rainfall in the spring. By this time, the fire season in Australia, which begins in October and is starting earlier and earlier thanks to climate change is over. How are you so bad at this? So your interpretation of the data is not only wrong, but what you're about to say next is a classic case of the Dunning-Kruger effect, as you're not only wrong, you don't seem to understand that the increased fires are regional in nature. Give or take a couple years. And you can see in the chart that the last three years in Australia have been a particularly dry season. But not an unusually dry season. In fact, when you take this chart as a whole, what you find is that the last 60 years of Australia, all the way back to 1960, are actually far more wet than the previous 60 years. So Australia overall, on the whole, isn't experiencing less moisture, less rain. The trend clearly shows that Australia is getting more moisture, they're getting more rainfall. And that's happening while carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere. Because pre-1960 carbon dioxide levels are significantly lower than post-1960 carbon dioxide levels. Now that we've heard the ideologically driven McExpert version, let's hear it from a scientist. It's a hard one to define because there are so many different ways of measuring it. But if we take rainfall alone, there's no evidence that Australia is getting less rain and no reason why it should. What's happening is that rainfall patterns are changing. And if we start looking at patterns from 1950, about the time temperatures began rising, eastern and southwestern parts of Australia, which are the big population and agricultural centres, seem to be getting drier, while the north and northwest are getting wetter. And that's been confirmed by scientific studies, which we'll look at more closely later in the video. So that brings us on to the most relevant trend, the fires themselves. Is the 2019-2020 fire season perfectly normal? Australia's acting and retired fire chiefs, each with a lifetime experience fighting bushfires, came together to warn the government, no, this is not normal. Never before have we had 17 uh, concurrent emergency warning fires burning at once. So there's something going on. And that's supported by scientific studies. The best way to quantify this is to look at the FFDI, the Forest Fire Danger Index, which measures the likelihood of fires breaking out based on rainfall, evaporation, humidity, temperature and other factors. At least two studies have shown that the FFDI has been trending upwards. This 2007 study is interesting because it not only found that the FFDI rose for the previous three decades, but it predicted that fire weather conditions would worsen, increasing the FFDI between 4 and 25% by 2020. That's now. And this study found that the FFDI increased significantly in nearly half the stations it checked between 1973 and 2010, a clear upward trend. All of which means, yes, there is something to see here. Now, this isn't to say that climate change isn't impacting this. 
because climate change is climate change. That's why they switched the term from climate change to global warming. But the impact should be mitigating the fires, not expanding them. So what's actually expanding the potential for fires in Australia? So obviously, AJW is just talking out of his southern orifice, and has no idea what he's talking about. Also, the graph he's showing here is for a single weather station, as made obvious by reading the header on the graph. This is not the average for Australia. This is the average for Australia. That's why experts don't do it that way. They take national annual averages and build up a complete picture. And by including all the data, this is the complete picture. And right away you can see the obvious warming trend. This reconstruction from Berkeley Earth shows a 12-month moving average in grey and a 10-year moving average in red. And this one, which is a straight plot of average annual temperatures over time, comes from the Bureau of Meteorology. And that's how the BOM determined that December 17, 2019, was the hottest day on record thus far. And the answer to that question, which shouldn't be surprising to anybody who watched the beginning of this video, is in fact environmentalist. Because like in California and in other places across the world, there's been a move by environmentalists against fire mitigation techniques and controlled burns for environmental reasons. They believe that they kill too many birds, too many animals. These things are not good for the environment for whatever reason. Now, due to the fact that they don't do the controlled burns and protests stop the controlled burns from happening, there's a lot more fuel around to feed these wildfires, and that's why we're seeing wildfires increase exponentially. So it should be no surprise at this point, that actual justice warrior is 100% wrong. As I pointed out in my video where I debunked no bullshits video, where he made the same claim, environmentalists aren't preventing controlled burns. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't. For one, controlled burns do happen, they just aren't the panacea quasi-climate deniers like AJW pretend they are. Secondly, as you're about to see in Potholer 54's video, not only are environmentalists for controlled burns, changing weather patterns, due to climate change, make them more difficult to conduct. Firstly, the Green Party, which is pretty representative of the Greenies in Australia, supports prescribed burns. It says so in its manifesto. Secondly, the fire chiefs, and in case you've forgotten, they're the experts, not the pommy politicos, say this is not a problem they face. The single biggest impediment to completing hazard reduction burning is the weather. Uh, and and with, longer window, uh, with longer fire seasons, uh, uh, earlier starts and later finishes to fire seasons, like we've been experiencing over, uh, over recent times, uh, you get a shrinking window of opportunity for more favourable hazard reduction burning periods. And in that, in that shrinking window, uh, you, you get the extremes of, of it can be too wet and too cold to effectively get hazard reduction burns done, uh, through to it being um, uh, too hot and too dry and therefore too dangerous. Look, it's very clear, and any fire service will tell you that the windows for hazard reduction through the winter are getting narrower and narrower. Now, a slight lift in temperature overall, average temperature, means the extremes are more extreme. Burn. Uh, we, we can't light a burn and just let it run. Mm. Uh, lighting a hazard reduction burn is complicated, it's resource hungry, it's risky, uh, and the minute we see a burn lit, uh, I end up getting inundated with claims for, for people wanting us to, to pay for their shade cloth on their greenhouse. The, the sun tough on their back pergola's now got uh, embers that have landed on it. So, so there's so many ramifications that come uh, from prescribed burning. It, it's, hazard reduction has a place and is a valuable tool for day-to-day -to -day fires, for, for normal seasons. But when you've got a really tough season, when you've got awful fire weather conditions, so when you're running fires under severe extreme or, or worse conditions, hazard reduction has very little effect at all uh, on, on fire spread. It's only when the conditions back off a little bit, generally speaking overnight, uh, or, when the, or, when that, or when the severe extreme or catastrophic conditions get right back to say very high, that you've actually got some prospect of, of slowing the fire spread. So so it's important, but not the panacea, and something that we should have a very open and, and frank discussion about. The other point here is about the, all the emotion around these fuel reduction burns. The reality is I, I am concerned, and it's interesting now my peer in New South Wales has said the sun come out quite strongly, Shane Fitzsimmons, and said exactly the same thing, which is essentially we can't see um, these fuel reduction burns as a silver bullet.
yes, they are. Yes, we need to do fuel reduction burns, but they're not going to solve all our problems. Fuel, so, example in Gippsland, where we had a fuel reduction burn go through in 2014, didn't slow this fire up at all. And I can say, in any given year, of all the burns that we've got ready to go, uh, 70 or 80 per cent are cleared, environmentally ready to go. We're just waiting for the window of opportunity. We, we are, we've gone from completing, lucky to be 40, 40 or 50 per cent of our annual burn programs to now up to 80 or 90 per cent of our burn programs. And according to the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, the main reason for the increase is not the successful quashing of greenie protests, but increased funding for the crews that do this hazard reduction work. Sorry, carry on, Shane. If there's a risk in an area and it needs treating with hazard reduction work, we can serve notices on private and public landholders to get that work done. Yes, burning is important, but some of the hysteria that this will be the, the problem that solves or the solution to all our problems is really just quite an emotional um, load of rubbish, to be honest. The figures back all that up. In its most recent annual report, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service said it had planned 19,896 prescribed burns and carried out 16,556 of them. That's 83%. I'm sure people will post anecdotal tales on the forum of how they weren't allowed to remove trees or burn bush on their own properties, but every council is different. Every neighbourhood is different. This is the view from my backyard. We've had to evacuate twice as far as fires got close, so I'd love to do a prescribed burn every couple of years in our wooded area that backs onto a national forest, or have the fire service come in and do it. But even if conditions were right during the short time period available between ever-lengthening fire seasons, the biggest objections would come from my neighbours, not because they're greenies, but because they're worried that a prescribed burn might get out of control and destroy their half-million-dollar houses. That does happen. Regardless of individual cases, what these trained and experienced fire chiefs are explaining is the overall picture of the difficulties they face in carrying out prescribed burns, the success they've had despite these difficulties, the increased rates of hazard reduction, the fact that these prescribed burns aren't a panacea anyway, and their frustration at the way armchair critics are getting emotional over the issue rather than looking at the facts. And when the blame game runs out, it's finally time to face the question of whether climate change might be contributing to this. Before we end this video, I want to point out another one of AJW's fallacies. He claimed that environmentalists also prevent controlled burns in California. This is false. In fact, you can visit the Sierra Club website and see that they promote controlled burns. What prevents controlled burns have more to do with already limited resources being exacerbated by longer fire seasons thanks to climate change, budget constraints, and grazing patterns. But hey, why do actual research when you can repeat the same fallacies as the other YouTube McExperts?